Well, welcome everybody who's here already. And I'm Britton Trice with Garden District Bookshop. And it's my pleasure to welcome everybody tonight and uh, welcome back our old buddy, Mr. Bragg. Uh, we miss see seeing you in New Orleans. And uh, it's, it's a different world out there, but you know, everybody's going step by step, day by day. But another book, another wonderful book on the, on the shelf. Uh, we're excited about this one. Um, all the great columns from, uh, I know, Gardening Gun and uh, what other? Um, Southern American? Living. Southern Living. But, uh, you know, more wonderful stories coming out from my friend. Uh, and he, we're going to be in conversation with uh, his good friend and journalist, uh, Terry Chancali. Terry, welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Happy to be here. <laughs> so uh, everybody who's here, um, if you have any questions, we're gonna. Uh, if you would just type those into the chat room, uh, the, there's a little chat button at the bottom of the uh, menu or wherever your Zoom menu is, um, and just type the questions in. And we'll get to <laughs> get to those. So anyway, I'm gonna turn this over right now to uh, Terry and Rick and let them go at it. And I'm Great. gonna jump in there myself and see what's <laughs> going on. So Rick, welcome back to Garden. No, Mission it's good time. to see you. It's good to see you. So my friend, um, this book seems like the perfect antidote to 2020. What, what made you decide to write this or put this together right now? Well, first off, bless your heart. Yeah, that's what we hoped, you know? I mean, it's what we were hoping it would be. It's, you know, the, we, I had, we're working on a couple of books, uh, you know, we, uh, and, um, I think uh, this one was probably in the works just as COVID was on the horizon. You know, we were seeing it more on CNN than, than we were feeling it. You know, uh, we're seeing it in, in China. And, and but um, I hope it's an antidote. I, I, maybe just not an antidote. Maybe it's a balm. You know, maybe it's just a balm. Um, for all this stuff. I, well, there's a lot of humor in it, which uh, I, is is perfect for the moment, it seems like. How did you choose? I hope so. How did you choose which stories to include? Well, it's pretty easy, actually, because um, uh, you, you kind of, because we had a collection, um, uh, a collection of magazine stuff, uh, you know, about three or four years ago, I think it was. And, um, you know, wanting to do a book and getting to do a book are two different things. And, and so we did this collection a few years ago and it did, did pretty well. And so that makes the publisher go, well, you know, maybe we ought to do something. Maybe we ought to do another one of them. And, um, so I, I, I kind of picked, obviously, most of these stories are more recent, but also uh, it gave me a chance to kind of go back and find these lost stories that even I had forgotten about. And, you know, I, you know I, I'm, I'm not like you. I'm not defying time. You know, my <laughs> mind is shot. You know, my mind is gone. And, and I, but I went back and found some things that, I wrote for uh, like a, a small local magazine, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I did a piece on Billy Graham uh, about the, and you know me, you know that, you know, I, ha I hadn't stepped through the door of many churches cause, the, you know, I'd have burst into flame. But, <laughs> but I, but, but I'd always as a child been captivated by that voice. So when Graham appeared as though he were gonna gonna die, um, I did a, a piece on that voice. Uh, so you know things like that. It just kind of gave me a chance to kind of reach out and and kind of claw it all together. And 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 there was a probably a real focus on the lighter stories you know, yeah. about wearing Tupperware on your head. And, 
I love so. the Tupperware on your head part story. Did you not wear Tupperware on your head at any point? No, I don't recall actually putting it on my head, but I do know that I was very uh, excited when I saw Tupperware come out because like you say in the story, it meant something good was going to be put on the table. Yeah. When did you ever see Tupperware that it didn't mean uh, something really great? I mean, right. uh, it was you know, like I just remember when people, you know, people didn't always worry about presentation you know and I know down there in South Alabama they you know they didn't particularly worry about presentation that much yeah. so if they brought fried chicken to a to a family reunion it would be a warm cloth a clean like a clean dish cloth in the bottom of a big Tupperware bowl and then they just be fried chicken piled in on top. I mean, what's better than that or banana pudding but the only thing better was when you like when your mama's not looking you get in the cabinet and you take it out and you wear it on your head and you were immediately uh spaceman spiff or or i spartacus you know running around with a stick and a tupperware bowl on my head so it's a lot of that in this book it is. It's fun. My favorite part of that uh, Tupperware when I was a young boy was burping the, the, <laughs> burping the top. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a science. It's a, it's a science. You traveled extensively as a journalist, you know, to the Middle East. You lived in Boston when you did your Neiman, but you have continued to come back to the South you know, first to the, to the region and then now to your home place in Alabama. What, what is it that draws you back? Well, it's always, um, I've always wanted to be that writer who, you know, uh, wandered the world. And I got to do that a little bit. You know, I live from New York to LA and Boston to Miami and, and and I did get to I mean I did get to hear a holy man's call to prayer over a mosque in Saudi Arabia. I I I, I did get to see like a bull elephant standing in a in a in a savannah. Uh, but I always kind of wanted to be that guy that you know did some deep soul searching came home to find himself you know late in life well that ain't the way it works in the real world i came home because i i needed to you know my mama uh, got older my uh, uh and got got ill uh she's doing okay now thank goodness but you know um i got a little sick you know i had non-hodgkin's so I, I really came home to kind of tend to things, you know, to kind of tend to things. But I found that maybe that's what it, it is to find yourself when you come back home. You know, I was just tending to stuff. My little brother, Mark, um, needs a little help hauling hog feed or cement bags. You know, cement bags weigh 80 pounds. And I'm pulling them out of my pickup, the back of my pickup, standing there with that grit in my eye and, and thinking two things. First off, this used to be a hell of a lot lighter when I was, you know, when I was 19, 80 pounds of a cement bag was no big deal back then. Now it like pulls your insides out. But, uh, but the other thing I remember thinking was, man, seems like I should have been like further along by now than, you know, still looking around the cement bag. But I, there isn't any other place I can be. And I, and I don't mean for that to sound romantic, you know, but I don't, I don't think there's anywhere else I can be right now. And uh, so that's where I'll be. What is it about where you come from that you want to convey in your stories? What is it you want people to, to know about where you're from and the people you're from? Well, you know, and me and you have talked about this before, that Southern writers 
and, and, and Britton, I know you've heard this. Southern writers love to say, well, I'm not really a Southern writer. You know, they love to say, I'm not really a Southern writer. Cause that, cause if they admit that they're a Southern writer, that means that they're somehow not cosmopolitan enough or worldly enough. Well, I'm sure we sell more books in San Francisco than we sell in Sylacauga. You know, I'm sure we sell more books in New York than we sell in some parts of South Georgia. But I, I've never minded being, I've never minded that label. I think it's more a, a, a style maybe or, or a language than it is a region. And when I get letters from people who read the books, and nowadays they come, you know, from a text to a to an email to a to a all the you know even plain old snail mail. It'll be somebody from Utah, or <laughs> Terry, you lived in Arizona, right? You know, out in Arizona, and um, or someone from the Great Lakes region. <clears throat> I wrote a story about a gopher rat stealing a, a fish off the ice of an ice fishing camp and running with it toward me and it like scaring me to death and i got i must have got 40 letters from the great lakes region um so i, I think it's not I, I think when you say that the south has a state of mind i think you have to admit that you share it that state of mind um it's more class, and I've said this all my life, it's more class than region. Blue collar working people, or people who have blue collar working people, or people who have a heart for blue collar working people are all over the place. I got cornered by a guy in England in a bathroom. He was an Irish bookseller. And I didn't understand the word he said, but he was happy that he had found some kind of kinship with a book on the deep south. So I think it's just everybody has either put Tupperware on their head or been very happy to see it. And I think I think the I think writing about family, and, I, and I've never, you know, I've, I've never wanted to be that warm and fuzzy. I always tell people, my family ain't the Waltons. You know, we're not the Waltons. Uh, but writing about family, writing about funerals, writing about worrying that, that the things that your people say and do and the way they live is slipping away. I think that's everywhere. And now I can't really remember the question, but I rambled around so much. I must've hit on the somewhere. <laughs> you did, you did. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this, uh, this next one so I don't mess it up. But um, you write in the prologue that these are stories, quote, of the South's gentler, easier nature. There's great affection for the region in this book, um, but you can love a place and still be disappointed by it. How do you, um, how do you deal with that, that contrast? Well, I think that one is, is admitting it, you know, admitting if the editor calls you and says, what are we going to do about Charlottesville? You know, what are we going to do about Charlottesville? Um, the, the, the easy and more profitable answer is to say, we're not going to do anything you know we'll just we'll just let it slide by or this is not the kind of magazine that does that kind of things mm -hmm. you know that you could say that too but you can't you can't do that so you write a a, a story about how we can pretend that what these nitwits these racist nitwits do does not color us as a region does not color us all we can pretend that that doesn't happen 
but it's not true. And, uh, and you take some hit. The only hate mail I've ever gotten in my life was when I wrote uh, against the Klan or wrote against militias. Um, and it's just, you know, it was just a light, not a light story. There are no light stories about people dying, but, but it was, um, you know, it was, um, you, you challenge that backwardness, people will find you. And um, when BP almost ruined one of the most magical pieces of our planet, I mean, if you think about it, BP came very close, very, very close to destroying a gulf. And, and, and not a little bitty gulf, but a vast, deep, beautiful, sparkling place. Um, so the way you uh, approach it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a lifestyle magazine is you, you write about what it was like before it was threatened, what it's like to be five, six, seven years old rolling down a dune or splashed in the water or catching a, a little crab in your hands and taking it back to the hotel and putting it in the bathtub. You know, you, you, and, and then you, you know, I remember writing that everybody that looks at the Gulf of Mexico feels something unless they're hollow. So that's how you kind of do it. You know, you, you, and then you say, and now it's threatened. And then you go interview the old fisherman who lives to tell stories about catching that, that, that one great fish in the Gulf of Mexico. And now he realizes watching the, the slime and the plumes of oil roll in that he may never get to tell a story like that again. So you know, as a, you, you, you take a very lifestyle approach to a bad thing. Uh, but you can't not, you know, I mean, guess you can, but, you know. But, you didn't write about it, though. Yeah, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not pretending to be. I mean, you know, I, I'd love to put on a high hat and strut around in it, but the fact is I'm just not built for it. I but the one thing that you should be able to do if you write about living in the deep south is write about falling down. You know, you should be able to write about falling down. I've always said that, that if you're gonna do memoir or essay, then you have to be humble. You can be arrogant in one paragraph, but you better damn sure, you know, be humble in other places. and. And, and so if you, you know, if you're going to write about sunshine, happiness, hope and joy and puppies, then you better occasionally, if you're writing about the deep South, you better write about meanness and, and backwardness, uh, you know, and cruelty, those kind of things. Now that I've cheered us up. Well, <laughs> right. uh, so, you know, tonight, tonight's event is based in New Orleans, even though you're in Alabama. Um, I know you love New Orleans as much as I do. Uh, right. Talk about what's so special to you about this city. God almighty. I know we'll be here for a while with you doing yeah, that. Yeah, we, we, everybody might as well send out for, send out for a Pope boy or, a, <coughs> um, well, I had a bougainvillea at Bush in my backyard. You've seen it, you know. Yeah. It, it was a, it was a ragged bougainvillea. It was, it was raggedy and 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 all it was really good for was sticking you, you know, and and every bad freeze killed it. That that one bad <laughs> freeze a year, you know, and. And then it'd come back, and in spring it would be. Spring. Spring. It would be. It would. It would. It, it, 
and it would just, you'd walk out your back door and the air would be so thick that you had to breathe it twice, you know, to get any real air in your lungs. And there would be that color, that explosion of color. And to, to sit back there and have a Barks root beer, because, you know, I'm not a hard drinker, you know, y'all know that. But to have a Barks root beer and a pork chop poor boy, po boy as we of the city say it, and a, you know, and a bag of Zaps hotter than oh, hot potato <laughs> chips. They sent out all the, the correct one to everybody. They're halfway that, through. <laughs> I, you know, and just live, you know, uh, and to walk through the quarter and actually hear somebody practicing trombone, you know, coming from a window uh, or to sit there. Well, first of all, to hear Rosie Leday, you know, play an accordion in the rocking bowl on Thursday night. Uh, or to, to, to just sit in one of those benches on the river and watch the freighters go by. And, and to a country boy like me, you know, and again, I've seen harbors all over the world. But to see a freighter as long as three football fields, you know, glide down that river. And all you got to do there is sit and watch it and maybe eat a mango off the blade of your pocket knife. I mean, that's just, you know, there's something about that stuff that if it wasn't in New Orleans, wouldn't be as magical. I can't explain why the city limits of New Orleans make that, makes that, you know, better. And one of these days I will be able to explain it and then uh, I guess I'll quit. <laughs> Did, the first time you came here, was it for work or was it for fun? I was, I was, it, I, it was back in my, I was single and I was uh, dating a young woman uh, at LSU and she lived in Metri. And um, I, I drove over from, from Birmingham and um I don't really remember how this happened, but I remember an uptown bar. And I remember uh, leaning against a post in an uptown bar because I needed a little help standing up. Then I don't remember anything else about that. I lost about 12 hours. That's a pretty typical story for New Orleans. Yeah, for New Orleans. Yeah. And so that's my one great New Orleans drunk story. And the only one I have. Is that not sad? You know, that's kind of sad. But uh, I remember waking up in one of them little beds that uh, that they have for kids, you know, that looks like an airplane, you know, has a propeller at the foot of the bed or something. It was, I guess it was the guest room. And I remember thinking, I sure would like to have them 12 hours back. I would like to know <clears throat> what I did. Because <clears throat> no matter how notorious it was, I got a feeling that when I'm 85, that would be a good thing to think about. It'd be good, yeah, to have that story. Yeah. You could just yeah. fill in the blanks if you wanted to, right? Yeah. Probably just involve eating two lucky dogs and regretting it and oh yeah, you know, stumbling around. But no, I, I I have been coming back to New Orleans. You know, I used to when I was uh, when I was a reporter, I would I would be walking through the airport in Atlanta. I would have come back from someplace. And I'd be walking through the airport in Atlanta. And I had an apartment in Atlanta. And I'd be on my way home and I'd be tired and I'd be just, I don't know, just kind of just tired of traveling. And then I'd pass the gate and I'd see New Orleans leaving in 45 minutes. I'd just turn in there 
you know, I just walk, I just get, go there and change my ticket. And that was back in the days you could do things like that. And, and with no plan whatsoever, just go to the poncha train, you know, fly in, rent a car, go to the poncha train. They always seem to have a room somewhere and uh, maybe stay in the Mary Martin suite or the, the William Holden suite and, you know, go to the Bayou bar and watch an old man play the piano and drink a ginger ale. Well, that poncha train was your second home for a while, wasn't it? Yeah, I kept luggage there and I kept luggage there and, um, there's something about waking up in the poncha train in the, you know, the, the, the cool dark of the poncha train because they had real curtains on the windows and they were heavy, big velvet curtains. And pulling the curtains back and looking down on the neutral ground there, watching the streetcar go by. And I've always loved that phrase. And the day was filled with possibilities and you don't know what that's like until you, you know, until you've stayed in the poncho train and, you know, seen that streetcar going by. You mentioned Lucky Dogs, which reminds me of um, <laughs> not, not a meal we had together, but many meals that we have had here. And um, in the book, you have an essay about commanders um, bread pudding souffle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we also have a piece that you talk about Ms. Dunbar's fried chicken and a meal at Upper Line. So I wonder what would be your perfect New Orleans meal? Oh man. See that, that no matter what you say, you immediately, it's kind of like being asked what your favorite book is because then, you know, two or three days later, your mind will be in a different place and you'll say, well, I should have said Lonesome Dove, or I should have said Moby Dick, or but, but I, I guess if I were going to start with anything, I would start. We'd have to go outside New Orleans just a little bit, but I would start with a bowl of coleslaw from Mike Anderson to restaurant. I wonder if you had gotten an email out about the new money minder program. There's, you know, we out, get emails out. now from somebody named Karen McCall uh, and she sent, she, I'm sorry. I'm getting a bleed in this. from somebody talking about um, a money minder program. I lost yeah, my sent, invited us to learn about the new money minder. Okay. Um, and I, Michelle, you need to mute I, your phone. I recorded it. I mean, I accepted it. And then I realized it was at the same time. As with Craig. Are we still are we still yeah. cooking? We're good. All right. Uh, but I, uh, uh, I you know the 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 Mike Andersons in Lutes out there uh, near uh, going toward Carville out in that area out there. Yeah. I've uh, never been there. You never been there? It's it's it was exactly the same as the old Mike Andersons uh, in uh, that used to be on Bourbon. Yeah. And and the same as the one in uh, Baton Rouge, but uh, but they have the best coleslaw. That and a cracker, purple cabbage, shredded purple cabbage. You know enough mayonnaise to kill a normal person. I mean that's a reason to live, but. You know, I, I always fought over who had the best gumbo in yeah. town, but you'd have to have a bowl of maybe, uh, maybe that. She sent me another link. Oh, one that works. I think I'm on mute. I'm sure you can tell me 
Okay, Rick, I think you're, I think you're muted. Yep. Rick, you need to unmute yourself. I don't know how you got muted. How about now? There we go. Yeah. So I've been talking to myself about, <laughs> about bread yeah. pudding souffle and yeah. I not, was wondering why you had that funny look on your face. Time, but part you, of you were very polite about. Well, I'm sorry, y'all. I don't know how that happened. I didn't touch it, but um, well, it was probably my fault. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it, it. You could get pretty much the best meal in the world at Peggy Dunbar's back in the old days. You all you had to do was go in and get all the fried chicken you could eat with stewed cabbage, red beans and rice, and a square of cornbread. I mean, what's better than that anywhere on earth? Our Betsy's Pancake House, you know, the, the, they used to have a ham shank and a puddle of red beans with a little side of potato salad. I and mean, what's better than that? So I guess the, the real, the fine cuisine of New Orleans was, I guess, lost on me because I was happier with red beans. I was happier with fried chicken. I was happier with, um, you know, I, I was, I kind of liked that big old fried artichoke they had at Frankie and Johnny's back in the old days. Um, you know, I guess I, my tastes were pretty pedestrian, I guess, but man, what a place to wake up in, swing your feet out of bed, and I touch that old pine floor of my house there at the corner of Joseph and Annunciation, and this, the minute your feet hit the floor, you knew you were going to get away with something. You were going to get That's away so with murder. And usually that was food. You know, you're going to eat something you shouldn't have. Pretty much every day. Yeah. Yeah. Every day. Well, hey, so you and I talked before about you maybe reading something from the book. Did yeah. you pick something out for us? Yeah, I thought I would. Since we've we been talking about New Orleans and since, first off, I'd have no collections at all if, if it wasn't for New Orleans. Because what would you say a fifth of, every, of pretty much everything I write, I write about New Orleans. Um, and I love other parts of the South. You know, I love to go to Savannah. I love to go up in the mountains up in North Carolina. I love to do all that. I even love Texas. God help me, you know. Uh, I even love Texas. But... But New Orleans, I, 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 for some reason, the writing has always been kind of pulled to that. And, uh, and I used to volunteer to go to New Orleans in, in, in August, you know, to, to fi find a story I in August. Yeah, I mean, it just, you know, it just, I, and, and so I thought I would write, this, this is called the mean season. And y'all forgive me if I, I stutter a, a bit through this because um, uh, I can't see for crap anymore. So uh, that's a great way to start a reading. I don't, I can't <laughs> see for crap, but, but this is called the mean season. And I think anyone who has ever passed a day in New Orleans in August will know what I mean. The clip-clop of the mule's iron-shod hooves is so slow, the step so far between, you wonder if it might have died mid-step and is just waiting for a hint of a breeze in the hot, wet air to push it on over. Clip, then an eternity. Clop. And I am relieved. The atmosphere is already thick enough here in the French Quarter in the misery of late August without throwing a dead mule into the mix. The mule hauling a pair of parboiled tourists and a guide in a woeful, wilting top hat creaks and creeps off toward the old St. Louis Cathedral, 
down a narrow street jam with perspiring half drunk people. The tour guide recites a history of the city as they wobble past, but New Orleans is too old to tell about in one buggy ride even pulled by a slow motion mule and a steaming time warp. It takes ages before it finally lurches out of sight. The tall glass in my hand had been filled with ice when I first saw the mule. Now it sits in a tepid puddle on the tabletop. I should get up, I think to myself, and go do something. So I ask for more ice. People say this is the worst time of year to visit, that the place never was intended for August. It takes a whole lot of ice to make it so. But I think New Orleans and summer are like old enemies that have, after a hundred, hundreds of years, fought to a drunken draw. Having failed to kill it outright, summer tries to smother it a little bit day by day. I like it here, even in the mean season, the months when eating an oyster can take your life. I'd rather sweat in New Orleans, listening to the iron squeak of an old streetcar, feeling the wind off the river on my face, than summer someplace precious. That's kind of the way my, I mean, I've always, I'll put up with a lot you know, even August, just to kind of, kind of be there. We go to the Tennessee Williams Festival and, you know, I, uh, people, uh, the phone call would come in from the folks, the organizers and I, and, and they'd say, would you like to come down? And usually when you get an offer to come to a festival, you think, you weigh this against that and all that. But usually when they say, would you like to come? I say, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll be there. No problem. You don't have to weigh it so much if it's New Orleans. No, I, and I think it'll probably be that way for the rest of my life. Yeah, I, I can see that. Let's shift to talk about your family. You mentioned you, you, you write in The Talker that your uncle Jimbo was the greatest storyteller in a family of great storytellers. What did he and the rest of the storytellers in your family teach you about doing your craft? I mean, it probably wasn't a craft when you were a kid and you were absorbing all that, but it's led you to this place, right? Yeah, imagine that you could make a dollar from it. How about that? You know, how, you know, most, my Uncle James, Uncle Jimbo, um, I saw him outside the, uh, the food outlet grocery store. Food outlets closed down now. Um, my sister-in-law used to be the manager there. And, but I saw him outside the food outlet and I said, how you doing, Uncle Jim? And he said, told me he'd been wandering in the cemetery. And, and, it, and to me, that was just such a gothic thing. He was 93. Just such a gothic thing, to, you know, that an old man, the image of an old man wandering in the cemetery. So my mind began, immediately began to spin about, you know, the, the, you know, talking to the spirits and all that. And, and, uh, uh, you know, I said, well, you gotta, you gotta wander around there just so you can find somebody who, who appreciate you. And he said, yeah. And then he thought for a minute and he said, and besides son, that's where all the widow women are. And he was still dating or trying to at 93. Uh, but they could tell a story when I was a little kid. Yeah, they were always into something nefarious. They were all always getting hauled into jail and standing with a sling blade out on the side of the road with a deputy standing over them, you know. Uh, but uh, I would always, 
sit and listen to them and they can make you hear the chains rattling in the pocket of the deputy who was chasing them down an alley. You know, uh, my mama and my aunts could tell a story and could make you live it. I mean, they could make you see a see a, a, a baby born and make you uh, hear the song sung at a funeral. Uh, so I just never figured there's a way to make a living at any of that. Y'all know what I mean? I just didn't figure there was any way to make a living at it. And uh, when I became a newspaper guy, I realized pretty quickly that you could write with imagery, detail, and color of the storytellers in a family and apply it to the events of the day. And, and that's where I found a living, you know. But I'm not as good a storyteller as they are. And that's, and that's not something to say. I mean, that's by God the truth. I'll never be as good a storyteller as those old men and old women. And they're mostly gone now. You know, I guess I guess I'm them now. But you've I'm also the geezer. You've also, um, you know, you told their stories too, so they're they're in print. I hope so. They're living on. I I hope I did them justice because um, I'm not one of those southern southerners that believes so much in ghosts. You know. I believe in a, I believe in a, in a, uh, you know, 14 year old boy with an AK 47. I mean, you know, uh, I'm not really worried about ghosts. Um, but the older I get, the more I realize that Pat Conroy and Willie Morris and people like that were right. You know, the, our ancestors are right at hand. You know, they are right at hand. And uh, uh, so I hope I've done them justice because I'd hate to make that right now. <laughs> I, I think you're okay. I hope so. When we were young reporters in Birmingham at the Birmingham News in the 1980s, mm -hmm. Could you have imagined where your career was going to take you to the New York Times, to Harvard for a Neiman, to writing nine books and being a best-selling author? We were pretty, um, we were pretty scruffy back then. <laughs> you know? Well, first of all, I was scruffy. I was scruffy. You ain't never been scruffy a day in your life. Don't even try that stuff. I've known you for I won't say for how many years, but many years. And, and, uh, but yeah, I was pretty scruffy. You know, I, I had a Miami Vice jacket. I remember it. Yeah. yeah I had a Miami Vice jacket and, and it I was prone. Jacket. It was just one you wore. Yeah. I was prone to go without socks. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I thought that the most important thing in the world was um, was having a good time and being across the top of the front page. And I had no other, I had no other ambitions. Um, and it cost me actually a lot over the years. I'm not going to whine about it. It's just the way it was. But... Um, no, I, 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 I just, you know, you know, I didn't really go to college. Technically, I'm still a freshman at Jacksonville State. Uh, and I, I was tickled to have my job. Of course, I complained about it nonstop because that's what we did back in, you know. But, but no, I, sometimes um, I work for people who had my best interests at heart and, and who protected me from myself. A long line of, of not institutions, and I work for some great institutions, but I work for some people 
who had my best interests at heart and um, and um, gave me a chance to, you know, I mean, I had they'd hand me the shovel, you know, or the uh, and 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 tell me where to dig. So I always had good editors, and even now in my in my book life, I have uh, probably the the single best book editor in the business. Her name is Jordan Pavlin. People say that having her as your editor is like winning the lottery. You know, uh, uh, my agent is Amanda Urban at ICM and she's the meanest uh, woman I've ever known on my behalf, you know, but she's mean on my behalf. She. She has been, had more, um, you know, changed my life. And, and so there is a lot of luck into it. You stumble into things. And I always managed to stumble into, you know, I would be walking a two by four over a septic tank and fall in. And I wouldn't come up smelling like roses, but it wouldn't necessarily come up smelling like a septic tank either. You know, so I've just been lucky, blindly lucky. And the only skill I ever had was, um, I mean, I was willing to do some of the hard things that you have to do. But the only skill I ever had was being able to tell a damn story. You know, being able to, you know, know, tell it with, you remember that old boilerplate when we were, when we were younger, you know, show me, don't tell me. Yeah. You know, and um, and I've never done anything except that, you know, just paint a picture and hang it on the air. And and if you can paint a picture and hang it on the air, then people will go with you. Nobody's. You do that, you do that really well. I think that's a gift, though. I think it can. I'm not sure it can be taught to to the level that you do it, but. Tell us, how can we be better writers? How how do we do that? How do we paint those pictures? Well, you know, Gene Gene Roberts was my editor at the New York Times. And uh, he told me that. He said, and it's, I guess it's a compliment, but he he said, said, yeah, you can, I'm not sure you can teach what you do. Um, uh, But I, I think you can teach writing as a craft. I think you can teach it like you teach wood shop. I think you, 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 you know, you cut the boards, you pick the lumber, cut the boards, try to nail it straight. And then you paint it with all the, the, the color that it deserves, you know, and, and um, so to me, it's always, you know, looking at it that way, it always seemed pretty simple. The organization is the part that always tortured me, organizing, you know. Uh, but but I think that what I tell, um, what I tell young writers, uh, uh, you know, students is I tell them, not to break the rules, not to, you know, break the rules of overriding, you know, but that nobody has ever sat down to eat a rice cake. You know, uh, remember those you, I think you can still buy them. Nobody's ever sat down to eat a rice cake and, and said, "Mm, man, I'm glad I spent the last, 10 minutes of my life eating that rice cake. But sausage gravy on a biscuit, you know, be that, you know, be that, be colorful and rich and lustrous. And I was lucky that most of what I got to write about most of the time when I got a little older was pretty big deal. You know, I, I, I got to write about a big deal. And, and so, so, why would you, you know, good writers always say, no, hold back. 
And I would say, no, don't. No, don't hold back. Don't be gothic or florid or, 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 or scrambled. But be, be as clear as you can be. But, you know, ha have a, a touch of the grave in it. I mean, if you're writing about killing and dying, You know, you you need to, there needs to be sadness in it, and and the way that you convey that is you you find the image. You know, um, after after the Oklahoma City bombing, um, uh, and they convicted McVeigh, the bomber in, uh, I think it was Denver. And my job in Oklahoma City was to write about the reaction. And uh, and I was just stumped. I mean, I just couldn't come up with anything. It didn't sound like a cliche. So I, I, I started going through all these old newspapers about his victims, about the people he'd hurt. And in that, one line after another, it occurred to me that I didn't need to be fancy. I didn't need to be cliched. I didn't need to talk about the cost of it all. I just needed to show it. So the, the lead was after the blast, people learned to write left-handed, to tie one shoe. They learned in houses that had had sounded with with children to stand the silence they learned to look in the mirror at faces that made them want to cry and to cry from glass eyes they learned to sleep with pills or to sleep alone and um there's nothing fancy about it. It was short sentences, uh, one comma maybe, you know. But I was always proud of it because I thought that what we did with it was showed what was lost. You know, showed what was lost. And, and there wasn't any preaching in it, you know. There weren't any sermon. Uh, so I think that, that that simple thing, that simple old cliche of, of, of show me, don't tell me. If we just remember it on every graph, then I think we write for people who we write to for the reader. You know, the way, exactly the way that Miss Dunbar used to cook her chicken. Exactly the way that the chef who is in charge of nothing but the bread pudding souffle does the bread pudding souffle. The same way that, um, the, same way that the architects that nailed together my old house there on uh, Joseph Street, they built it out of, uh, I think there are, are steamboat timbers in it. But it, you know, it was just a, shotgun house but it was a beautiful shotgun house because of the way it was nailed together uh, i'm sorry i got i got caught in the moment as we like to say in the right it's, it, it's being connected to new orleans even by zoom it brings that out in you. yeah 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 so, uh, I, I, assume you I mean I, I assume you were a storyteller first and then a writer um when did you start writing I start writing when I started giving me a damn paycheck for it I was a uh, uh, I was uh, I got a, a job at the Jacksonville Alabama News I had worked for my high school paper but oddly enough high school papers don't pay the best in the world but I got a job the year I graduated from high school at the Jacksonville, Alabama News. They paid me $50 a week, and it was probably the best job I ever had. 
I sat in press boxes and watched baseball games, you know, and, um, and the only way I was going to get into the writing business was through the sports department. And uh, so I was a sports writer for the biggest part of my writing life. And I never made very much money at it, but I, it was my way uh, to, uh, to practice my craft and to realize, um, to write something that was really important to people. You know, writing about, you know, football in the state of Alabama. I mean, you know, it's kind of like writing about football in the state of Louisiana, you know. I almost got beat up one time. Uh, it's why I don't really drink in New Orleans. I had been in uh, Giacomo's and a bunch of Louisiana fan, a bunch of LSU fans were in there and they were pretty well drunk. They were all toasting LSU and I, raised my glass of the Crimson Tide, and I like to not made it out of there. So um, anyway, moving right along, I have, <laughs> I, newspapers were a godsend to me. I mean, they were, uh, they, they meant the world to me. And, and nothing makes me happier now than seeing one. You know what I mean? Just seeing somebody with one under their arm or seeing one at a restaurant. You know, but they were that the newspapers saved my life. Were they a good training ground for you? Absolutely. But more than that, if I had finished my writing life in a newspaper, then I would have been that would have been fine because I loved um man, I just love the, you know, I love the feel of that newspaper in my hands I, that I can't quite get with a, you know, I, I do some stuff occasionally for online, purely online publications. Um, but there's nothing, there's no substitute for feeling it in your hands. I agree. I had the same, the same uh, love of the newspaper. Nothing. And, and it, it was good to me. The yeah, yeah, good. it it yeah it gave us something to do for a few decades. Okay. Otherwise, we might have wound up, Who knows? you know, in serious trouble. Right. So, um, I want to ask you since it's almost Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. you have a, this is this is from the best cook in the world. This mm -hmm. is not from your current book, but you have a story about you you having a misadventure with a frozen turkey in the A&P parking lot. And um, I just wonder, have you gotten your turkey for this year? And did you get it home without incident? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, doing for Thanksgiving? I think things through a lot better now than I did in 1964. Um, I do have a turkey. Uh, my mother told me to get a small one this year because you know, our families get smaller, you know. And uh, I, I and it is froze hard is I don't think there's anything harder. You know what I mean? You know, the military is always looking for new materials. We just ought to shoot frozen turkeys at people <laughs> because there is nothing more lethal than a frozen turkey. I mean, if it slips out of your hands and hits your foot, that's the emergency room. You know, this so particular story, the turkey. Um, fell to the ground and rolled down a hill, right? It rolled all the way. I caught it right before it got to Highway 21. That's not a, a joke. It, the, the, the parking lot was um, shaped. It wasn't just a downhill from the front of the store. It was a slanted downhill. So when it took off, it did kind of a sweep and turn. You know, you know frozen turkeys are not perfectly round. So it did kind of a sweep and turn and having me running after it, trying to judge its trajectory, you know, run, I think I had on flip flops uh, and it, you know, cause in November, you know, in November in Alabama, it's still, you know, 85 degrees. And um, yeah, it was, but I knew that if I didn't catch it, how do you explain to your mama, that you let Thanksgiving dinner roll out into traffic 
on Highway 21. <laughs> yeah. It just, it's not possible. But yeah, now this time it is safely in the refrigerator downstairs. Because, you know, in the country, you know, you never throw one thing out of your refrigerator. So there's no room. So we have another freezer downstairs. So it's, it's waiting. And my mama can do things with that frozen turkey, which should not even be edible. I mean, you shouldn't even be able to eat something froze that hard. But she will cook it to death and it will fall off the bone. It won't look like a southern living turkey, you know, but it'll be delicious. Why don't we uh, open this up to if anyone has any questions for Rick, uh, they can unmute themselves and uh, go ahead and ask a question. Uh, sure. I know Anybody some of y'all, you have to have questions. They're all mad. <laughs> the system works Nobody? Okay, I'll go first. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Gina. Hey. Um, so I, I feel bad because I'm going to take this conversation away from New Orleans and back to Alabama. Is that okay? Yes. That's okay. fine with me. <laughs> so me, you guys are both such great representatives of our collective Thanks. home state. Um, and Alabama has certainly been in the news a lot lately. What do you wish people knew about Alabama? Well, I guess the first thing is that um, Alabama is not a monolithic thing. You know, it's it's not. Um, if you start in the northern corner of the state and you go south, you go through about 15 different worlds uh, ending up on the Gulf Coast. Um, I would love to say that we've gotten, um, I would love to say that we've gotten uh, more progressive uh, but the truth is that there is a, a there's kind of a retro, um, just like there is all over America. There's a there's a resurgence of the meanness, a resurgence of the closed mindedness, and that affects Alabama as much as any other state. Um, uh, and I wish that were not true. But there's also here uh, an awful lot of people fighting against it, and um, and I'm and I'm proud of of those people very much. Um, but you know, you, you can't like if you can't do like an Alabama accent because. Uh, you know, Terry's accent is actually, you know, refined. Mine sounds like uh, it was born in a pool hall. You know, the hillbilly accent of the northern part of the state of working class people is completely different from the way people talk in the, the southern part of the state. Yeah, Gina's, um, from, Gina's from the Wiregrass. Yeah, well, yeah, well, y'all know what I mean. So, um, I, I think the uh, people just will never understand how varied Alabama is. I write mostly about the people, the foothills of the Appalachians. I don't really understand the the Montgomery South. You know what I mean? I don't really understand um, the, 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 I certainly don't understand the veranda south. You know, I, I've never been to Cotillion. You know, I, I've never, um, so I, I, I'm still trying to kind of figure it out myself. 
That's a hard question. I stammered all over that. No, I loved it. I thought you're right about the accent. People from Northern Alabama sound much more Southern than people from Southern Alabama. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I, there was a movie actor who um, um, was doing, uh, if I remember this correctly, doing some, you know, big Hollywood thing where he, 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 he was supposedly from Alabama and, and he, he listened to uh, Ava's Man, the recording I did of Ava's Man to do a, 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 a Southern accent. But it was down on, but the movie took place down on the coast where people don't talk at all like I do, you know, and, and but uh, yeah, it's complicated. It's, com you know how people in New Orleans, you know, if they do a story about New Orleans, they'll, all of a sudden you'll hear this Mississippi accent come in out of the blue and you go, where in the hell did that come from? You know, I only lived there three years and I know people don't talk like that down there. I can't even fake a New Orleans accent because there are five, right? There are like five or six New Orleans accents. There's, you know, there's the, the uptown ladies, you know, uh, there's, you know, a God, you know, it's complicated. We have a we have a question over in the chat. Um, I'm going to read it. It's from my friend Jenny LaRoe, who worked at uh, NOLA.com and the Times Picayune um, before going back to California. Her question is about um, how to describe the culture and the camaraderie of a newsroom to someone who hasn't experienced it. Um, and you know, I I don't know about you, but I think some of it is born from just spending almost every waking hour <laughs> with these people because um, you're working very long hours you're working all kinds of crazy ships and stuff and um, there's a lot of pressure I don't know what do you think I, I think that it is probably the the I guess everybody can say this but I think it's probably the, the, one of the most unique uh, workshops on earth. Yeah, I worked with pick and shovel crews. You know, I worked around bulldozers and tractors and, you know, did work with my hands. And there was, uh, there was a camaraderie in that, that, you know, I, I, I cut pulp wood. I did, you know, work with a chainsaw. And there was a camaraderie in that blue collar work that probably didn't exist in other places. Uh, but a newsroom, I think it makes you cynical in a way that's not necessarily all that bad. You know what I mean? If you work in a newsroom, you, you got your lying politician, you know, who's lying like nobody's business. And you're in your and you're talking it out. And, um, you know, you you. You're utterly unconcerned with things like, uh, like they make you wear a tie. You know, how Birmingham News always made us wear a, a tie. But, you know, it's the worst time on earth. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, you, you, and, and there's a single mindedness of purpose. There's you and that phone on your ear and your fingers on that keyboard or scribbling notes. And that's what's important, getting that down, getting that done, and then crafting it into something, a story, getting the story, writing the story. I was never a blood, you know me, I was never a bloodthirsty uh, reporter. I, you know, I never did catch anybody doing anything. Didn't want to, but I worked beside people who did, you know, who were very good at it. And, uh, but you're, un you're kind of unconcerned with anything beyond that and and uh, I knew a guy who would put white out on his tie after going to eat at the barbecue place or on his shirt you know I'm not going to tell you who it is because you would know um, but um, uh, you know 
there would be, you know, you'd have you bring your jacket in, but you never put it on. You just kind of threw it in a corner of your desk and it might stay there all week. But the rule was you had to have a jacket and you had to have a tie. But the best people and the best lunches and, you know, great gossip. I mean, there's a bunch of snarkiness, you know, but but I have friends now that I made then um, that uh, endured because uh, we all kind of understood that sweatshop. You know, we understood that machine. I, I, I can't even explain it. It just show, usually I can explain things, but I didn't do a good job. But it's hard to explain. It is hard to explain. I think that was Jenny's problem too. <laughs> so one thing from uh, Maria Montoya, um, who's now in Detroit. She's left New Orleans and is in the cold, cold sure. uh, environs of Detroit. She said one time you said what she thought was a sad, kind of strange thing was to see yourself, your work in a clearance bin at a bookstore. And she wanted to, um, wanted you to know that she now co-owns an indie bookstore in Detroit. And one of their rules is no Rick Bragg in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> so you're safe in Detroit. Well, you know, I, I, the way, the, the great thing about if you do see your books for sale in a used bookstore, is uh, if it's a hardback, you better buy it because uh, someone's going to ask for it in your family, you know. So now, when I if I do see like an old, don't see any all over, but the Shoutings hardly. But if I do see an Avis Man or Prince of Frogtown, I buy them and take them home because my mama will give them. Will have promised one to somebody. Um, and the thing about, you know, the thing about publishing houses, you know, they send you a couple of boxes of, you know, the new book, which disappear immediately, you know, because uh, my, my mom doesn't believe in letting a book like linger, you know, in the house. And, um, but the, the, the saddest thing is a thrift store when you're going down the row of thrift store books and you, you know, you're in good company, you know, Larry McMurtry's there and, you know, Carl Hyson's there and, you know, you're in, you're in pretty good company. Um, and there you are. Dollar 50. <laughs> so you reduce to a dollar 50. Um, uh, that's all right too. I'd rather somebody buy it for a dollar fifty and read it than not read it. I'd rather have somebody give it away than not read it. Don't let my publisher hear that. I have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I was born in New Orleans, but I grew up in that non place that Walker Percy calls Covington, Louisiana. I know Covington, sure, sure. And so I've always, I'm 74 now, and I've always thought of writing, but I, the, what happens is I want to know how to overcome the fear of putting, of turning yourself inside out and putting yourself on a blank page for all to see. I simply, don't think I can do it. I've tried. I can't. Well, how do you overcome that? Well, if you've done it for a lifetime, the the, the quick answer, the flip answer is to say, yeah. get over it. Of course you can. Of course you can. It's your story. And even if you're writing nonfiction and you're writing about family. See, I was fortunate in that, that I wrote about grit and violence and deprivation and loss. But there is also, you know, joys and victories and, and survival. And the fact that you're sitting there, the fact that you're sitting there with a, with a choice to tap a goddamn key you know, to, you've got the choice to tap a key. 
means that you have the right to tell it. You're the writer. So, you know, I didn't have to worry about breaking the hearts of the people I wrote about because there was, while there was much in it that was dark and regrettable, there was not that awfulness that, that so many people face, that sadness that so many people face of a thing that just tears their soul out, you know. So I can't tell someone with, with that kind of terror what to do, but I can tell you that the fact that you're still vertical, you know, the fact that you're right. still vertical gives you uh, the right to do it and also erases any, I believe this, erases any, uh, any reason why you shouldn't do it. Um, I, I think writers get paralyzed thinking ahead too far. And uh, I, I seldom, I seldom in my life have ever, because I was a newspaper guy and I, I knew that when I wrote it, it was gonna have an audience. But if you got a story to tell, don't worry about the audience at first. Worry about getting it down on paper. And then you can you can worry about the rest. That's easy to say when you've been doing it for a living for a long time. But I really believe that people get paralyzed by the business of writing. And and that stops them from from getting it down on paper. Does that make any sense? I hope it did. Yeah, that's a big lots. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Rick, I see that uh, Maria had another question uh, about asking what your favorite authors were. Oh, man. <sighs> we truly better plan on having breakfast then on this cause, uh, well, I, my, you know, the, the book, I think that there are a lot of books that you read that kind of change your life. Um, when I read McMurtry's Lonesome Dove, you know, which, you know, won the Pulitzer Prize and was considered, you know, one of the, the you know, the, the, the great sweeping sagas, you know, in American literature. All I know is he took the characters and made them get up and walk and talk, almost like some kind of, of animation. He brought them off the page. And um, um, and uh, I began to look for other books and I read Last Picture Show. Uh, you know, read the kind of bleak, stark, hopeless, you know, kind of banality of a, of a, of a Texas town. Uh, um, read the wisdom of Sam the lion, you know, um, and I read Dickens. Uh, this time of year, I always reread A Christmas Carol. You know, but done for money. You know, he did it for money. And yet in it are, is that line where he describes Marley, screwed ass Marley about the clanking of the chains. And Marley says, this is a, I forged it link by link and you know, out of lock boxes and time pieces. And that just sent a chill down me when I read it um, because I understood it. You know, I think we all do. And I understood it as a kid and I sure understand it now. You know, when he introduces the two urchins and their names are what want and ignorance 
and you can pay for them now or you can pay for them later so much more dearly. And in that is a lesson to you know, be kind and be generous. And you know, I don't usually talk like that, but that, you know, there's a lesson in that, in that literature. Um, you know, I love the great thick sagas of, of, you know, generations gone. You know, I mean, I still think Moby Dick's a great book, you know, um, um, but, you know, except for the just unparalleled sadness, you know, Charles Frazier's, you know, writing, um, uh, Ron Rash's uh, writing, his poetry. He has a book of poems about a cotton mill that's as good as anything I've ever written in my life. It's that thick, you know, and it's poetry for God's sake. You know, I, you know, me reading poetry truly is, you know, perfume on a hawk. And, um, and yet, you know, I just love James Lee Burke. You know, his description of a, of a juke joint at night, I think this was in Jolie Blonde's Bounce, his description of a juke joint ablaze at night with neon and throbbing with music and, you know, breaking glass and screams and laughter. And then it, the next morning, it disappears. I mean, you know, the building is still there, but it disappears. It goes quiet and gray and invisible. You know, and I, you know, uh, how can you not love that kind of, um, you know, if this, even if I didn't like the stories, I'd read it just for the power of the images. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and tomorrow it'll be something else. And I'll leave, you know, uh, when I was a child, I read, um, I traveled with writers. I read James Clavell so I could travel to, to Asia, you know. I read Forrester so that I could see India. Uh, you know, uh, I read stories about places that I thought I would never see. And then when I did see them, I saw them in the language of those writers. That was better somehow. It was like they prepared my soul to see it. And I probably talked too much on that. But. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for staying with us tonight. And uh, I'd like to also apologize for the people who had trouble logging in. Uh, in this modern age, I never know what's going to happen with technology and Everybody was supposed to get one simple button to say, join the meeting. And of course, you know, it sounds like that didn't work so well tonight. So I apologize. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that we do record these uh, events and uh, usually they're up on, our, I, up on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. So uh, uh, for those of you who joined late, uh, you can check out the, the YouTube channel. Uh, just go to YouTube and search Garden District Bookshop and you should be able to watch the whole video. But uh, Terry, thanks so much for uh, leading us in this conversation with Mr. Bragg and Rick. Always a pleasure. No, anytime. You know that. Anytime. Maybe, maybe this next time next year uh, we can do it in person. Yep. Let's hope. Yeah, Keep our fingers crossed. Thanks for thanks for uh, joining us, everybody. It's been a, a nice evening, and good to see yeah, you. Buddy. This was fun. It's good to see you again. It's good. I feel like I'm there. I feel like I'm back there. Oh, no. Well, you know, I live about um, a block from your old house. <laughs> oh, now you're just being mean. I would feel the vibration. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're just being mean. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, well, thank y'all all. And uh, and I will hopefully I'll see you uh, in a in a in a 
better time. Yep. Take care. All right. Take bye care. bye, y'all. Thanksgiving. You too. Stay well. Bye -bye. Stay safe. All right. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you.